All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world at the moment. Welcome to this version of uh, First Tuesday's webinar series by the ESG Exchange. I'm Alex Hetherington. I am of the Third Line Group, a sustainability consulting operation in uh, based in South Africa, but uh, but with global outreach as well. And today we are tackling a very very interesting subject. I think Barack Obama called inequality the greatest challenge of our time. Um, economic inequality. Are the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? What is the implications that uh, that these widening income gaps might pose to the sustainability of business going forward? I'd just like to start with, um, with a quote from the International Monetary Fund in 2015, who claimed that widening economic inequality results in significant implications for global growth and macroeconomic stability. They go on to say that inequality concentrates political and decision-making power in the hands of a few, can lead to suboptimal use of human resources, and can cause investment-reducing political and economic instability and raise risk of various systemic crises. These are quite some claims. But what is meant by economic inequality? It can be an entanglement of statistics. But if so, what are and who are the culprits of inequality? Has business contributed towards this? Or has business contributed positively in, in mitigating inequality? What does inequality in its different shapes and forms actually mean to the long-term sustainability of business across the world? To help us in our understanding of this, we have two, I think, very esteemed panelists and, uh, and we're very grateful to have them, have them with us this afternoon. From New York City, Caroline Reese is the co-founder and president of Shift, a nonprofit working with businesses and their stakeholders to ensure business is done with respect for people's lives and dignity. Caroline has, uh, has deep involvement in, in the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights and was a, was a contributing author of, of those principles. Prior to Shift, Caroline was, among other appointments, Director of the Governance and Accountability Program at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She is currently a commissioner of the Business Commission to Tackle Inequality, a coalition of organizations who have come together to address inequality and place it at the heart of business's agenda for sustainable growth. Professor Mark Swilling is the co-director for the Center of Sustainable Transitions at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa a well-known commentator and author on inequality and just transitions. Mark is also a visiting professor in the Georgetown Environmental Justice Program at Georgetown University in the US. Uh, he sits on the International Resources Panel, is a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science, and is the outgoing chairperson of the Southern African Development Bank. In December 2021, Mark was appointed as a commissioner to the South African National Planning Commission which among other things, Mark is tasked with reducing inequality in South Africa as measured by the Gini coefficient. No mean task, I must say. <laughs> um, so thank you both for joining us from, uh, from different parts of the world. I think uh, there's plenty to discuss. There is going to be some rich topic here. As we normally do in these webinars, I will facilitate a discussion among our panel for approximately 25 or 30 minutes and then open up to questions from our attendees around the world. Um, this is where we often get very rich discussions. So I don't in any way intend to direct or manipulate the conversation. I let it go as best as possible and within the realms of, uh, of common decency. But let me start off um, with you, Mark. It, 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 economic inequality can get uh, subdefined into many different formats, in, it's inequality of, um, of outcome and inequality of opportunity as two subcategories. But perhaps you could just go a little bit further for us and, uh, and discuss exactly how you view inequality, how you define it, and how is it actually um, measured and, and is that measurement appropriate? 
Yeah, well, as you say, it's highly controversial, uh, exactly how to measure inequality. And I think you can roughly make a distinction between static perspectives and historical perspectives. The static perspectives essentially break down into two. One is the Gini coefficient, uh, which has become increasingly sophisticated as the data databases of countries around the world have become more reliable. And essentially that's a measurement of income inequality. Uh, so, so based on uh, the spread of incomes in a particular country, you arrive at uh, an estimation of the degree of inequality. That's the most popular de de definition and almost all the conversations and, and writing about inequality is essentially about income inequality. Uh, and then the various policy initiatives to uh, to to reduce uh, inequality and also to debate whether how how good inequality actually may or may not be for growth. For some, it's a good thing because it lowers wages. For others, it's not because it limits distribution. So so that's the one. But the other definition, which I think is particularly important for South Africa, is. Uh, uh, popularized by the economist Piketty and is essentially about assets. Uh, so it's an unequal distribution of assets. Um, and, and, and that has got a, obviously a lot to do with uh, inheritance uh, and is obviously also directly impacted by tax. So as a result of Piketty's work, there's more and more uh, research going into inequality in terms of assets, including in South Africa. So researchers have for years tried to pressurize the, 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 the South African Revenue Service for tax data. And only after Piketty visited South Africa did they go back and say, listen, you celebrate this guy, but you don't give us the data. Uh, so researchers got the data and that in turn has produced the kind of earth shattering uh, um, empirical data, which says that 90%, uh, uh, over 90% of uh, of assets in South Africa belong to just less than 10% of the population. And that excludes um, family trust uh, because the tax data on tax family trust you know, gives you a different picture. But we all know rich people keep a lot of their assets in family trust. Uh, so this is one of the, this is the, uh, it's, it's on average, the, the average OECD inequality in terms of assets is not nearly as serious as that. Uh, so, and this has got a lot to do with history. Uh, and so that's the other paradigm, understanding inequality as the product of historical evolution of ownership, in particular of land. So that's on an, in a nutshell, okay. that's a complicated debate. <laughs> it is a complicated debate. There's no doubt about it. Caroline, I want to bring, bring you in here. Um, I mean, and it's, 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 uh, the fortune magazine this year actually published an article by Branko Milanovic. Um, a Serbian um, American economist with the City University there in New York, near you, uh, whose um, work has highlighted that actually globally, the Gini coefficients, which is uh, at, uh, in this case referred to as, as an income uh, inequality, has decreased in recent years. So he refers to three periods of growth, one post-industrial revolution, where inequality rose, income inequality rose, and then during the Cold War period, a tremendous uh, rise in income inequality, but in recent times, it's reduced. Now, the question that I'm going to pose to you is, are we seeing actually greater inequality taking place, and is it subliminal? Is it, is it outside these typical figures that we see perhaps captured by the Gini coefficient? Are you able to, to, to provide us with examples of other areas that might not be necessarily captured in the figures that that actually indicate greater widening of of both um of resources and opportunity yeah well um you know this this question of of measurement does seem to be some somewhat fraught um and i think you know i just want to start out by saying that as we talk about inequality because it can be misunderstood sometimes i think right this isn't a proposition that everybody should be exactly equal in 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 wealth income and and so on and, and, and so forth that that's not a realistic world what we're talking about is the extreme levels of inequality and looking at it in terms almost of how that generates sorts of tipping points 
where the fabric of society starts to, to break down, right? So we're looking at the degrees of inequality and to Mark's point, you know, that Gini coefficient that looks at, 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 at how that's, uh, how that's uh, changing and what that spread is. Um, and look, I mean, you know, perhaps different research producing uh, different results. I'm intrigued by that one, but certainly in general, the research being produced has suggested that in recent years, even income inequality has continued to increase on average. Be inequality between nations has reduced, right? That's important to underline. We're talking here about inequality within nations. So inequality between nations has reduced, although some research suggests that that may be stalling since, since COVID. But here, really, I think the focus is with, within societies. I mean, the Business Commission to Tackle Inequality that I've been part of um, highlights that <clears throat> actually over the last 40 years, the gap between the average incomes of the top 10% and bottom 50% within countries has, has almost doubled. Um, Oxfam indicates, you know, this, this wealth related, so asset related, uh, globally, the richest 1000 have captured almost two thirds of all new wealth um, since 2020. Uh, that's nearly twice as much money as the bottom 99% of the world's population. Uh, and, you know, from the World Bank, you know, clarity that we are now uh, at a halt when it comes to reducing extreme poverty, right? So on the bottom end of that spread, um, as we look at it, um, and, and in the middle of what looks like the largest setback in addressing global, po global poverty since the Second World War. And indeed, UNDP has found that human development is falling in nine out of 10 countries. So, you know, those are some pretty compelling statistics that would suggest that when we look at inequality of income and wealth within countries and of course there's variety between different countries I was seeing the other day that Slovenia seems to have the best score on the Gini coefficient um, so, so there's, there's quite a, a range of experiences here but as we look across um, the world in general uh, we're seeing this continuing growth in inequality into these extreme areas where we get these sort of detrimental effects for society, trust in institutions, we start to see more extremist, um, popularist um, views and, and uh, um, ideologies coming to the fore and, and so forth. Uh, but I think finally, just to say that, you know, you mentioned inequality of opportunity as well, right? Um, yes. and, and it's really important, I think, to look at the relationship between these things, right? It's, it's almost a uh, something that, that feeds on itself, right? Where you have social inequality, so typically marginalized communities, uh, whether it's racially, by gender, by other definitions, um, that the, the, the lesser ability in the first place due to less wealth, less income to access adequate education, adequate healthcare, and so forth, uh, will tend to then compound uh, these inabilities to um, access income, obviously education is such a precursor to that um, a future ability to generate income and and wealth and so forth. And, and so the the both the, the the lesser opportunity that many in society face compounds those other inequalities uh, and vice versa. Um, so the, the the two are really bound up with each other. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Caroline. I mean, I think it's very important to kind of distinguish between, um, the different kinds of inequality, there's there's plenty of evidence that seems to be available at the moment that particularly in advanced economies, well, uh, income inequality is, is widening significantly. Um, perhaps I, this is an opportune moment to come in and, and, and start to discuss what are the causes of, of, of this kind of a scenario. Um, again, Caroline, I'm going to stick with you. You, to, 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 you talk a lot about the uh, externalities of business not being, you know, imposing detrimental impact on on um, vulnerable sectors of society um, as a as a significant and you know significant contributing factor. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in many ways this is a systems issue, right? Um, this isn't about one actor; it's about government, it's about governance, um, business, and 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 markets. Um, but you know, one of the key things that we look at is the role of business in this. Um, I worked, you know, as you mentioned, for a number of years with Professor John Ruggie during his UN mandate as the Secretary General's UN Secretary General's Special Representative on Business and Human Rights. But John's academic background um, in political economy, international affairs, was really looking at how international norms and regimes 
uh, evolve and and looking at what he coined this 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 concept and theory of embedded liberalism, where we, it was really looking at in, if, if we talk about this instant case, the ways in which international regimes loosened and broadened, enabling over decades from the latter part of the last century, uh, the loosening up of, of uh, legal regimes, trading regimes, enabling the, um, the, the movement of goods, services, uh, money uh, across the world without sufficient protections at national level, let alone regional or other levels, to offset the negative effects that can flow from that, that inevitably flow, flow from that, on often the most vulnerable in society, right? So you get this disconnect, what John coined as a governance gap, um, as, as the international flows and, and all the benefits to business in these ways increase, but the protections decreased. Well, in some cases were static, but actually in some cases decreased. Um, also, uh, you know, supposedly sometimes in, in support of business interests. Um, and, and it's addressing that governance gap, right? Bringing things back into kilter with each other. Because what essentially happened through that, at least one of the things that happened was, as, as you said, this, this growth in the, the ability to externalize costs and risks. And we talk about how that happened onto the environment, right? The, the cost-free externalization of, of, of risks onto our planet. But the same happened onto often the most vulnerable uh, workers, um, communities, and, and so forth, uh, as these sort of uh, globalized uh, business structures um, and flows grew. And, and so really, I mean, that's at the core of what the business and human rights enterprise is all about. That's at the core of what the construct of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights are about. It's about saying that companies actually have a responsibility if you want to re-internalize some of this, right? They have a responsibility for impacts on people's basic dignity and equality, their human rights, that flow from the ways in which they do business. And that includes across their up, upstream and downstream value chains. So now government comes into that as well, right? They're the rule makers um, and, and markets really only work optimally when they are embedded within the right kinds of rules and institutions and companies need that themselves if, if they're to really thrive. Um, but when we're looking at that relationship, that systemic relationship between business and government and markets and governance, um, in order to recalibrate that balance and to, to bridge that governance gap. And when you're talking about governance, I'm assuming you're talking particularly here around corporate governance. Well, different kinds of governance, public sector yeah. governance as well, uh, international regimes, there's, there's their own form of governance. Um, and, and then, you know, the, the, even as we look at how different forms of governance act upon each other, you can think of civil society in the same way. They bring a force into this at, the, at that systems level as well. So actually, all of those actors have a role as, as we look in the international system um, in, in forms of, of governance. Um, and really what uh, the Guiding Principles Endeavour was, was about was looking at how you can get them to play positively upon each other, right? Each playing their different roles, but then playing positively on each other to mitigate the effects of how um, the particular forms of capitalism have evolved over the last 50 years. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mark, I want to bring you in. Uh, you've written uh, extensively around a concept that you call the financialization of the global economy. Can you go a bit deeper into that for us? Exactly what are you meaning by that? And, and, and how does that translate into growing inequality, um, either globally or within nations? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you need to have an historical perspective, uh, which which I suppose goes back to your, your the question you posed, Carolyn, uh, the, you know, the origins of inequality. So the world is really fundamentally shaped by this coincidence of a, uh, the aspiration to build democratic systems on the one hand and national market-based economies on the other, uh, otherwise known as capitalism. And it's this connection of capitalism and democracy that wasn't an, an ironclad uh, uh, law of history. It's, it's, they've, those systems have evolved separately and together in, in a multiplicity of different ways. But coming out of, um, uh, uh, as, a, as a result of 500 years of colonialism and the accumulation of wealth in, in certain metropoles, by the end of the uh, 19th century, that had resulted in an extremely unequal world, uh, which in turn led 
to the First World War as the, as the, as the imperial powers kind of competed and fought over who's going to control this colonial wealth. And it was really uh, when John Maynard Keynes was sitting at the Treaty of Versailles and, and looking at, you know, what was the causes of this? Uh, are we actually going to prevent another war? And he came to the conclusion, no, we're not, because we're going to punish the Germans and they're going to rise up again. And he, and he in protest, left the negotiations and eventually wrote his great book, uh, which was really about a general theory of, of capitalism within a democratic framework, which essentially said, left to its own devices, market-based economies tend towards disequilibrium. And the result is conflict. And therefore, you need intervention. And that's really what resulted in the, in the building of the grand welfare states of the Second World War. Uh, and eventually decolonization, and hence the period between the end of the uh, Second World War and the, and, the, and the 1980s was a period of reducing inequalities at a global level and within many in many different countries. But that, like all systems, they get sclerotic, they, they get bureaucratized, they become uh, gummed up with, uh, with, with old-fashioned regimes which are out of kilter with changing conditions. And so what you have is uh, originating in the Chicago School uh, with Milton Friedman, Hayek, and various others, a whole bunch of free market economists who essentially say, get the state out, uh, privatize, deregulate, decentralize, let the market rip. Uh, and that is the best way to ensure that you have economic growth and uh, greater uh, equality of opportunity in particular. Uh, and that really, that, that deregulatory regime that really kicks in from the late 1970s uh, and through the 80s and into the roaring 90s was, was about, uh, unlocked uh, uh, financial capital and the key drivers of growth. And this is the really important point. The key drivers of growth from the 80s onwards was not the primary sectors, was not the secondary sectors, it was the financial sector. And when growth is driven by making money out of making money, uh, inevitably, uh, the people who used to have proper jobs no longer have those jobs. So it's the breakup of the middle class and it's the construction of the wolves of Wall Street, the, 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 the ultra rich, the phenomenon of the ultra rich, uh, which is now uh, you know, between them, uh, the 0.1 percent have wealth equal to the borrowed 50 percent of the world's population, and this has got a lot to do with financialization. And the the the, the global financial crisis should have been um, the big writing on the wall. This is a this is bad news. Uh, it didn't. The, the global economy didn't collapse as a result of um, the two, 2007 financial crisis because of China, because China was lowering overall. Uh, cost of production and exporting products, which made it possible for the world not to collapse completely. Uh, but since then, the Chinese have, have have changed strategy. And so what we are seeing is at a global level, uh, a, a multiple, a multiple uh, set of crises now called the poly crisis, uh, which is really about um, the, the failure to find a new economic model. Uh, so there isn't a new economic model to replace the one that rose out of the ashes of Keynesianism uh, in, 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 from the late 70s onwards. There is an attempt to kind of rebuild a new form of Keynesianism. But the problem with that idea is that the balance of power between states and financial institutions has fundamentally changed. So you can't wish yourself back into the 1950s and say, Let's build states that are going to direct development when states actually did have the power to do that. Only 30% of all assets were financial assets. Um, uh, but now, 600, uh, the, financial, the value of financial assets is 620% of global GDP. Uh, and in that context, states are weak. Uh, so you can't just kind of like, okay, let's conjure up neo-Keynesianism and, 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 and use... Uh, the balance sheets of treasuries and central banks to kind of stimulate the, the green transformation we all want. You have to come up with a different way of thinking about that. 
to mobilize balance sheets in a, in a, in a way that's going to redirect capital into the real economy and into the things we really want. And that is dependent on whether businesses are going to play, play the game uh, of building purpose-built corporations rather than just replaying the script of uh, the Milton Friedman script, which is the business of business is business. End of story. Anything else is ethically irresponsible, he argued. That is what ki is killing us. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, it's, it's, I think I'd also like to just bring in here that something from the IMF as well, which touch, touches on the financial crisis of 2008. Um, it's the IMF themselves who, you know, this might be iron ironic in, in, in its authorship, but they, that, they do say that um, an increase in the share of the top 20% uh, actually results in a decline of GDP within a, within a country, a region, or even a world. That's quite a that's a, that's, a, that's an interesting stat I think because they can't oppose that that in contrast an increase in the income of the bottom twenty percent is actually associated with higher GDP growth. Yeah. Caroline, would you agree with that summation from the IMF? I wouldn't um, suppose to agree or disagree. I'm not certainly the economist in the conversation, but as you say, it's a, a compelling uh, statistic indeed. Okay. And, and, Maybe and, I mean, is, Alex, yes, Alex, we, need, we need to understand why they say that because it's part of a, uh, a tradition in the IMF, uh, which is when there are more people, just put it crudely, when there are more people buying more stuff, the economy grows. Right. And if you have smaller amounts of people buying more and more luxury goods, importing those from elsewhere, uh, you don't have to make enough stuff in order for enough people to have the jobs they need in order to buy the stuff they want to grow the economy. So that's why reduced inequalities is actually good for growth. Right. Uh, and and, and the, there's, there's, a, there's a strain within the IMF, not everybody at the IMF, but there's a strain within the IMF that has consistently demonstrated that empirically. More equal societies tend to grow better. So in, in the South African context with such high levels of inequality, Trickle down is not going to happen <laughs> because the, the the elite accumulation is so disconnected from the bottom of the pyramid, to use that awful image, that nothing trickles down. Okay, okay. Before I open it up to the uh, to the audience, and please, those of you who are tuned in and have got questions, do put them into the into the chat box or the Q and A box so that we can we can uh, put the questions across to the panel. But I'd like to now kind of focus in on. Um, what act, what inequality actually means to business, right? When uh, when one is talking about ESG, which is the you know the, the flavor of the month in terms of uh, of titles or, or or names, but we're talking essentially about sustainability. And sustainability, from a business perspective, has and must refer to the ability for business to be doing business in ten years time or twenty years time. That is a sustainable business. Um, and in a in a a future a resource constrained future that we're facing at the moment how and where does increased inequality actually impact on businesses being able to to be sustainable in those kind of time time frames caroline again i'm going to start with you and see if you've got any viewpoints on this particularly with the businesses that you've worked with and uh, and you know bring a human rights angle onto it please if uh, if, if appropriate yeah for sure um, well, yeah, I mean, as you rightly say, it, it does affect business. I think I just, you know, go back to that underpinning point. It's not some sort of um, exogenous shock unrelated to how business is done, right? I want to go back to that point that it's a two-way street here. But that, I think, is also the opportunity, because what that says is that, you know, business doesn't isn't just looking at this as something that ha happens to it. It actually has a really uh, strong role it can play in addressing inequality uh, as well through the ways in which it does business and through changing the ways in which it does business. But yes, um, indeed, it does affect business in various ways. I think we have more clarity right now of how it does so at the business specific um, end of things. I think it, it, there's a lot to be discovered still in how the macro effects of inequality affect business. How is business affected by uh, that loss of social cohesion and stability, the more extremist, polarized um, <clears throat> politics and views coming through here? And I would say this absolutely is not just an advanced economy issue as well, but it's very, very clear, it extends well beyond advanced e economies. Um, so we, I think we still have a lot to learn around that, right? And there's um, an initiative up um, 
at the moment to develop a, just as we've had a task force on climate related financial disclosures to have one on inequality and social related financial disclosures, where I think a lot of the research that will be needed will be looking at uh, also how does inequality as a system level risk affect business. But just at that micro level, um, look, you, you, you can look at things um, such as, uh, back to Mark's point, right, people buying things, right? If you're a Unilever or a Mars and you want to reach hundreds of millions more consumers around the world, that's not going to be possible if they can't afford your things, right? So, so clearly there is a massive loss in future business opportunity. Um, there was a, a piece um, that uh, various organizations, um, including our own, developed uh, last year on the business, um, wasn't the business case, it was a case for living wages. Um, <clears throat> but uh, looking at the ways in which, uh, on the positive side, paying living wages uh, is positive for worker retention, recruitment, lower costs, greater productivity, et cetera, et cetera. And the converse of that, of course, is that when you have workers below living wages, you're seeing the inverse of that. Um, Walmart is, is an example that back, I think, around 2014, 2015, it did increase uh, <clears throat> wages. Um, it, ironically, or perhaps predictably, its share price fell, but Walmart in fairly short order was able to show that their uh, worker engagement, their sat customer satisfaction scores, sales, staff retention, all of them increased as a result. So paying decent wages or not paying decent wages um, has a fundamental effect on your business. And these are all uh, facets of um, income inequality and, and, and creating or, or reducing it. If you're in the um, agricultural sphere, right, looking at pricing um, and how income at the smallholder farmer level is generated, um, looking at realities that in many commodities, the kids of today's farmers are saying, I, this is no life for me. I, I, I can't make a living. I'm not staying here to be the next generation. And you're seeing important commodities that simply won't be available in the quantities desired by um, by food manuf manufacturers and, and, and others, unless they address that issue of how value flows down to the smallholder farmer. And, you know, a company like McCormick has been doing work to, to strip out some of the the in intermediaries who just extract value and prevent value getting to those who are on the lowest incomes at the, the farm level. So these are all just examples that are quite specific. Um, what I think we still have to learn more about is that macro level effect on business, um, where and Mark may have some more immediate examples, but I think we probably are all going to do more learning. The, the final point that I'll make, Alex, is I'll bring it back to climate change, right? Because I think we spend a lot of time talking about how climate change is disproportionately affecting, it's not a future thing anymore, affecting um, poorer communities, more marginalized communities. Um, but the, it, it, it's not just a corollary effect. There's also the reality that inequality is a barrier to effective climate policies and strategies and transition plans working in the first place. Because if people can't put food on their table the next day, they're not going to buy in to your macro policy that seems so wonderful, but frankly is going to cost them more and, and, and push their kids further into poverty and a lack of opportunity. So it's a precondition to a successful uh, transition. It's not just uh, at the other end of, of how we address climate change. Okay, thanks, Mark. I wonder if you could come in on a couple of uh, microeconomic issues from uh, from a business perspective. And I'm thinking here, you know, the work that you do around just energy transitions, etc. Um, and that is, you know, that's a global global transition underway at the moment. Your, do, do, have, have you got some insights in that? That uh, you know, for businesses to be thinking more strategically around this. Well, the just transition, I think, is used in four ways, not just in South Africa, but uh, on the continent and elsewhere. Firstly, it's 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 seen as just decarbonization. And uh, you decarbonize the economy as quickly as possible. You you accelerate coal closure. You, uh, you accelerate economic growth and you have trickle down. So Rand Merchant Bank uh, came out with a statement middle of last year, more or less along those lines. Uh, the second position is where the aid industry is at, which is it's decarbonization plus social mitigation. In other words, welfareist interventions to mitigate uh, the impact on coal workers, negative impact on coal workers or fossil fuel workers uh, and their communities. 
The third position is decarbonization plus social mitigation plus green industrial transformation. And that brings in industrial policy. And as we all know, industrial policy has got this revival around the world. Um, and, and, and so there's a real opportunity to use industrial policy to now say, okay, what we want is green uh, industrialization, which is not just about putting solar panels on your roof and importing them from China, but actually making stuff. And uh, not just solar panels and windmills, but batteries and cables and electric vehicles and green hydrogen and so on and so forth. And the fourth position uh, is a post-capitalist position, which is you can't have an industrial uh, a just transition with uh, under capitalism. You need a post-capitalist environment and unions and radical NGOs articulating that position. So those are the four, uh, I think, ways of thinking about the just transition. Um, the bank that I used to chair, Development Bank of South Africa, as well as the just energy transition investment plan that the cabinet approved uh, is in the, in the third category. Um, uh, and many DFIs across the continent are in the third category. And, and a lot of people are wrestling. I've just come from Geneva where we, where we had an UNCTAD event on financing the green transition. And for five days, that was the conversation. How do you make sure that it's not just about a greening consumption? Uh, how do you use the, the, the transition underway to rebuild industrial economies uh, in a completely different way? And I think that's the great opportunity for South Africa. We, we're going to dismantle the mineral energy complex, which was the basis of colonialism and apartheid. And we have this opportunity to build a much more inclusive economy through uh, green industrial transformation of which uh, renewables just a part. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I'm going to, it's a, I mean, I'm, I'm in, intrigued about the idea of, you know, a post-capitalist economic system, but perhaps this question is that touches in on this. Which is um, has come from uh, a couple of of, of attendees. Seda was the original one to to ask it. But are we? It should, should we be using some other kind of metric to to um, measure countries and regions' wealth other than GDP? And you know, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the World Happiness Index. What a you know what a great kind of measurement to to uh, to incorporate in terms of a good place to live regardless as to uh, the nature of that society so a question to 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 both of you is you know at, at uh, are we looking at the wrong measurements yeah definitely i mean uh, but with the adoption of the sdgs we already have we've already diluted gdp so we really do need to recognize that uh, and uh, I, at the time of in 2015 i never would have predicted that you can walk into boardrooms and they actually could spell SDG. You know, I mean, the, 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 it's, it's possible. Uh, and, 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 and DFIs and government and global programs. And, and when the UN Secretary General talks about transforming the global financial system, echoing the Prime Minister of Barbados and the Bridgetown Initiative uh, on exactly that topic, it's all in order to raise the capital required to achieve the SDG. It's not about just growth. Mm -hmm. uh, anymore. Uh, and the estimates now are between three and, and five trillion dollars per annum is needed if we want to achieve the SDG. You know, so I, I think that I think the metric is starting to shift already. Uh, but we need to go further. I, I'm not saying that the hegemony of GDP has been displaced. Uh, one day it will be. Right. I think, I mean, it's, it's a, SDGs is a, is a, um, interesting player in this whole conversation and I'm from a human rights perspective Caroline I'm sure you've had to um, work with companies tremendously around SDGs and and the setting or the contribution that they make to SDGs um, are the SDGs a a effective tool and mechanism to focus corporate thinking around this and to um, and 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 for them to actually think about how they should be playing Within, uh, with, within a more equitable global society? Um, they can be, <clears throat> they can be. Um, I think they're a very powerful tool um, handled as their intent uh, suggests. Um, I think there's also been risk. Um, the risk is going back a little bit to sort of the um, last century's focus on what was called corporate social responsibility, right? Which was sort of more like, what, what can we do? Uh, how can we spend our money or make more money 
doing things that are good uh, for society. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're not making your money in ways that stop the externalization of these costs and risks, it becomes a sort of grotesque offset, right? So um, I'm less interested in hearing from a healthcare company about how they do their business, which is healthcare <laughs> and health products and so forth, than I am in, in hearing from the company that's really digging into uh, how its supply chains operate, whether people are paid a decent wage, um, there's freedom of association, uh, they're looking at whether they're displacing communities to make way for renewables, let alone old style um, oil and gas extraction, but renewables, moving indigenous peoples and other rural communities off their lands in the name of good things. So I think we have to be careful. They can be tremendously powerful. I'll tell another story. There was a, a company we were working with on living wages. We've been working with the Capitals Coalition on a model for accounting for progress towards living wages. And in looking at that, we'd also, and perhaps this goes a little bit back to that well-being point that was raised by uh, one of the um, one of the, the participants, um, looking at both that in in how you measure that in in sort of monetary terms and so forth but also looking at the health implications right the health implications of income and using um models that have been developed on the health utility of income to show that where people fall below a living wage their life expectancy falls now for a company that was already looking at health sdgs that was powerful that was powerful to bring in house and say, look, we are committed from the top level to how we contribute to SDG ambitions on health. And yet look at what it means when we're when workers in our supply chain aren't on a living wage. Um, and, and that kind of holistic thinking, I think, is useful. But we have to avoid this becoming some sort of of offset where we we just distract uh, with good things from from uh, the, the issues that underlie how business is done in the first place. OK, thank you. Um... Mark, any, any viewpoints on that? I'd say it's, uh, I'm hoping that kind of covers in some way Asai's question around, you know, the linking between ESG and sustainability. But I know you do have some viewpoints on ESG as it is, so yeah. you know, that as it's you know presented by by corporates. Yeah, just just uh, on 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 the SDGs themselves. There's no SDG for finance, um, and you know, and that reflects. Uh, a very problematic mentality, which is finance is just an enabler of what everybody's decided to do. But actually, if you if you're like me and you sit on the board of a bank for nine years, and you and you and you and you build an anthropology of what happens in the credit committee, basically the decision to allocate capital is a function of the imaginary of the people in the room uh, who are imagining future economic activities that they believe are going to come true. None of them would per se they can predict the future, but that's what we're doing. Uh, and so what's the future that's being imagined when you allocate capital? It's not just, oh, you know, supply and demand. It's you're, you're making the world. Uh, and so finance matters. Uh, and, 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 and that's why there is this building up almost to a crescendo of we have to rethink the global financial system. You can't continue if 600 and if, 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 the, if, the, if the value of financial assets remains at a grotesque 620 percent of GDP that means that tells you where the power lies and that has to change and many financial institutions are beginning to think about how to do that uh, you know ESG is one of the metrics um, ESG started life as you know doing good uh, and then a whole bunch of ESG practitioners realized you know, that's not that attractive uh, to businesses. So then it became ESG is good for bottom, for bottom line. Uh, and then it had to be quantified. And then it, and then it, it, it has become, I think, uh, quite difficult to do that in the complexities of what we have today. It is important that it's a positive step forward, but I think we have to go beyond that. We have to start uh, building metrics which say, does this investment have a transformative systemic impact? Yes or no, and it, I think that's similar to what Caroline is saying. Don't don't tick box uh, your ESG uh, 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 metrics uh, so that you know it's a bit like a, a fig leaf to hide what you really are up to. Uh, but you know that question is: this investment going to have a systemic transformative impact? Yes or no? You can make money still by doing that. 
but that's the question. And I don't think ESG asks that fundamental question. Can I challenge you on that, Mark? Yeah. Um, what is a systemic transformative impact? Well, in broad in, 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 in broad categories, it would be what restores the ecosystems we depend on, what decarbonizes the atmosphere before we run out of atmosphere completely, and uh, what's going to reduce inequalities. Uh, I mean, those those are the those are the transformative impacts that that we need because business as usual means we're going to fall off the edge. Uh, you know, it's just you know we either run out of atmosphere or we have a social revolution, and and you know, no, you know, we don't need need those. Either of which is uh, is unsustainable. And Alex, um, just to come in on that, yes. I think you know if if we're going to be looking at that scale of ambition. We are talking, I, I, Mark, I invite you to uh, agree or disagree on this, but we're talking about companies needing to work together with others. This is not the stuff of individual companies acting in isolation. This is the stuff of really thoughtful coalitions uh, across industry, but also with other actors, including civil society, public um, authorities, governments and others. Um, in order to drive this kind of change, in order to come up with the right measurements for this kind of change that is needed so um it, it's a really different way of thinking about uh, the issues and, and and rather than sort of thinking about how is my business affected what's happening in these four walls metaphorical or or real it, it's about opening that up and realizing none of that changes nothing changes unless we're really coming up with some collective collaborative and long-term and accountable solutions well may I, t t some solutions have been uh, have been proposed here from our, our attendees um, questions to to you as panelists as to whether they are um, will be effective in uh, in addressing this let me start off with uh, the issue of micro lending Caroline do you know much about that in terms of the work that you've done and has that been a, a force for good or it's, a, it's a, perhaps the opposite um, we haven't worked in micro lending um, but from you know what I've seen it, it it's um, it, it's been a force for good in many instances and in, in a couple at least it's perhaps gone off the, the rails a, a, a little bit um, with with time but I think the you know the basic concept um, of uh, enabling um, individuals small actors uh, micro enterprises to lift off in, in enabling money to get to more women um, as business owners or business startups um, and uh, getting moving past some of the uh, traditional uh, bases for bases for judging um, uh, credit worthiness and so forth in situations where individuals couldn't begin to match up to them. Uh, these these are sort of the the, the right kinds of foundations um, for progress. Uh, I think scaling uh, the, these approaches is is not always as easy as it would appear at, f at first blush. But um, Mark may have more to add on that from more direct experience. Mark, your your viewpoints. Yeah. I mean, I spent a couple of weeks in Bangladesh with Grameen Bank, and uh, there's definitely a role for those kinds of institutions. We have a couple of them in South Africa; they're all over Africa, uh, and it's been uh, the the new generation of microfinance is is electronic money, uh, cell phone banking, and so on and so forth. So I think it has a significant role to play for one simple reason: it puts uh, finance largely in the form of debt uh, into the poorest, into the pockets of the poorest people in society. And that, uh, if that translates into productive activity that allows them to pay off the debt and improve themselves, it can work. In South Africa, we have one of the largest microfinance uh, industries in the world per capita, and it's almost entirely extractive, uh, charging exorbitant uh, interest rates, uh, using very problematic violent methods to make sure people pay back, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole thing can turn nasty. Uh, so you, you, that's why regulation of that sector is really important. Otherwise, it's, it's the exploiting the desperation of the poor to extract usury uh, is, is, is just one of the most horrendous things. And it's destroying the base of our society across the board. A question that's been directed to you specifically land redistribution in uh, in south africa is this a um is this a valid way to to readdress 
past inequity and current inequality? And the short answer is definitely yes. Uh, we have uh, largely on the whole failed in our land reform program, but not nearly as bad as most people think. Uh, recent data uh, shows that but if you combine the formal as well as the market-based transfers of land, the formal state intervention and the market-based tra transfers of land to black people, it's 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 now running into about 25 percent uh, uh, of the of 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 the land, and you know that's higher than most people think. Um, uh, but still, it's 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 been a fundamental failure because we distributed land without business models that equips people to utilize the land productively. Um, and across the world, uh, I mean, the origin of global inequality, what is now called unequal exchange. Uh, really does lie in the disinheritance of the large majority of the world's population from their connection to the land. Uh, and uh, you know, that has to be part of the redistribution that is that is required. Uh, and in South Africa, if we don't do this quickly, it's going to blow up in our faces. So if I'm hearing you correctly, something like land re redistribution is a potential solution, but perhaps it hasn't been implemented correctly to achieve Greater equality. Yeah, and it's and there, and there's come low hanging fruit. There's gigantic swathes of land in South Africa owned by the state, which hasn't been redistributed. Uh, you know, everybody focuses on a small number of white farmers who are very productive and own gigantic quantities of the most productive land. And yes, that has to also get redistributed. But come on, the state must lead the way. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We are kind of heading towards uh, the final minutes here, and I do want to um, spend a little bit of time around just asking, what is it that we are exactly trying to solve for when, we, when we're looking at reducing inequality? Are we trying to bring the poorest out of poverty levels, bring them into lower to, to middle class incomes and, uh, and purchasing power thereof, which arguably might actually stimulate um, economic growth, as we were touching on earlier, are we trying to reduce the uh, the increase in wealth of the top one percent? What is it? To, to, what does a solution like this um, look like, Caroline? I'd like to hear your viewpoints on that first, for, uh, particularly from you know the uh, the response that you get when you are working with corporates around the world. What are they saying uh, is the solution? Um. Well, let me start with 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 that. Perhaps not. I wouldn't pin this on the corporates that we work with necessarily. But um, look, it, it's it's a harder conversation to talk about, um, you know, top executive pay and so on and so forth than it is, ironically, maybe not ironically, to talk about the wages of the lowest. Now, that doesn't mean that addressing the wages of the lowest is is a slam dunk. It's not, <laughs> but it somehow feels less less personal um, than talking about getting caps on the, the top executives and not least, I mean, I live here in the US where they're just mind boggling, um, mind boggling ratios between CEO pay and median pay in so many companies. Um, look, th there's no question that, that, that wages of the lowest paid is critical. That's why we've spent so much time leaning into this and looking at how we can get meaningful ways of measuring progress into reporting frameworks and benchmarks and so forth to get some accountability for moving up those on the lowest levels. Um, but it can't just be that. I mean, a, a, a second point here, and, and Mark's referred to it, is you don't manage that in a sustainable way if you don't have greater voice for workers. Um, if you don't have freedom of association, if you don't have trade unions, that the national system that the governments create an enabling environment for, if you don't have social dialogue and so forth. These are fundamentals, right? Because we're talking about power here. We're talking about the distribution of, of power. That's the absolute cousin of wealth and so forth. Um, so we, we have to be looking at voice and how we bring that uh, voice into the equation. And that it takes um, some regulation as well as uh, progressive business uh, approaches, recognizing what's in there long term, as you say, Alex, sustainable uh, interests, sustainability interests. Um, but then we can't we can't leave the conversation without talking about taxation. We absolutely can't. Um, bring that know, in. <laughs> too often, 
you know what one will hear companies sort of saying well look i i need to get on with doing business in 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 sensible ways i'm not trying to do bad things but it's up to the government to deal with all of these issues that sit around the business that's government's job but you know the same businesses will um you know find taxation strategies that avoid giving the taxes to the governments that would equip them financially to do those other things that enable the populations around their sites and uh, the workers, you know, who they rely upon to to have more uh, decent, um, equitable lives. Um, they minimize royalties that get paid if they're in the kind of industry that's paying royalties. Um, and they often lobby not to raise minimum wages and not to increase social protections and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, this... You, you kind of can't have your cake and eat it in this way. This is an exercise in, in distribution as well. This is looking at how value gets distributed um, and taxation is absolutely important in that. And, you know, it's good to see that through OECD and others, um, this is now a serious conversation, um, much more serious conversation. Um, but goodness, we have a long way to go on that front and it has to be um, part of the equation for any solution. Quick question, your view, your, your feeling, will business come on board on this? Or does it really have to be policy and uh, and and top down hand being being applied? Look, it's it's going to have to be both and. I, th I think I think we we do see more and more businesses being more and more responsible around taxation strategies. We absolutely do, and and one should not underestimate that. But look, we have hundreds of thousands of large and multinational businesses before you get down below that, and unfortunately, that's not going to be the driver for all of them. So we're going to need we're going to need a mix, we're going to need government, uh, and we're going to need international cooperation around taxation, right? Because we know the issues around hunting out those uh, venues where you can sort of uh, have a, a, a token presence and therefore, you know, get get your taxation base uh, located there. So um, it's, it's going to take uh, more than than just the businesses that are progressive and are enlightened around this at present. Okay, thank you very much. Mark, uh, at, uh, in, in a couple of minutes, I want to, that, that I'd love you to sum up. You spoke earlier about the failure to find a new economic model, I'm assuming globally. Uh, is that possible? Is such a new economic model possible uh, to find? Are we talking about a future of added taxation, progressive taxation to, 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 to bring about uh, a, a you know to close the gap as such. I definitely I definitely think the time is right for a new global compact uh, of the same significance as the Bretton Woods Agreement after the Second World War, um, and and that put in place a set of rules. I don't want to get into the debate about capitalism versus socialism. You know, kind of gigantic systemic issues. It's more the rules of the game. So. Uh, yes, taxation is going to have to play a role, but, uh, you know, our tax systems were invented when companies were these little tiny little dinky toys at national level. Now we've got these gigantic multinationals that can escape. Uh, so a big one of the big rules of the game that's being discussed is unitary taxation of multinationals where the countries get their fair share, for example. Another example would be dealing with capital flight out of Africa, for example. Capital flight out of Africa results in the net outflow of capital uh, out of Africa. If you, if you total it all up, total outflows are greater than total inflows. But capital flight is illegal externalization of capital. And over a 10-year period, it is, is worth three times total African debt. And that's facilitated by, by global financial institutions who are working within the rules of the game. Uh, but it's actually illegal. Uh, similarly, with uh, uh, special drawing rights that are disproportionately allocated to, to the benefit of rich countries, if there was an annual allocation of, of SDRs, in particular to the global south, that would change the ballgame. The average tax that Africa, that the global south, not just Africa, pays, uh, uh, sorry, the average um, interest rate, cost of capital, is 5 to 8%. The, the cost of capital in developing in developed countries before interest rates up went up was between one and two percent. If Africans were paying interest rates equivalent to what you pay in the developed world, there wouldn't be a debt crisis in Africa. You know, so those are all just a couple of examples of rules of the game that need to be agreed to if we actually want 
uh, a, 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 to achieve the SDGs, in particular SDG 1, no poverty, as somebody said, but also reduce inequalities is another SDG. Mm. And if you put those together uh, with the, with, with, um, with, uh, you, you then have to say, all right, well, what are the rules of the game that are going to make it possible for financial flows to go in the opposite direction to where they go now? Okay, that is such a, such good topic and, and, and thought for another discussion going for going further i mean i must thank you both so much this has been time has flown um it's been such rich discussion thank you caroline very much for coming in from uh from new york thank you mark um good luck with your function this evening that you you're in johannesburg for i'd just like to finish off with a, a quote from the 18th or 19 my apologies 19th century u.s president andrew jackson who says we should measure the health of our society, not at its apex, but at its base. Maybe that is just some some food for thoughts as we as as we uh, move on from this and uh, and look at other ways to tackle similar similar questions in in the future. I'm going to hand at it. Well, let me also thank attendees very much for for coming in. Thank you for your wonderful questions. They do provide um, such value into into these discussions. If any of you have any questions, either uh, to ourselves or to the panelists, please do send them through. We will endeavor uh, to 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 get them answered for you. Um, we have that commitment from the panelists, so thank you very much for that. And um, and Caroline, uh, sorry, Cullen, I'm going to pass over to you just to to um, uh, take us out and, and a vote of thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Alex, again, for a fantastic uh, webinar. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Caroline. Caroline, of course, being on the ESG Exchanges Governing Council. So thank you very much. Very special to have you on. And also very special to have Mark on um, as the chair of the South African Reserve Bank as well. I think this is the profound, uh, the implications from of what you're saying, Mark, and, and we really, really appreciate that. Thank you everyone online and the video will be recording, will be available always on the event page um, for people to have a look at and on YouTube. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you.